Hey, what's up? Big Ted in the building. I'm Tyro Atino. Welcome. Former professional footballer and Hanbury Star striker. Now commercial director. Most definitely here to speak about and what it takes to be a man. A man is a man who's uh, hardworking. You're a priest. Decent. You're responsible. You're a visionary. Taking care of your family. Because everywhere a man is, all these things must follow. Hello everybody, how you doing? This is your coach and your friend Robert Brawl. And guess what? This is the All Men Show, only on Switch TV. The best show in Eastern Central Africa, south of the Sahara and north of Limpopo. Last week it was very evident. We had a great, great show. Many of you from the messages, of course, you enjoyed, you blessed and you learned quite a bit. Today is no different. I have two great men on the show. And this is a show that delves into matters men. We are not looking for perfect men, but men who want to be better tomorrow than they are today. Men whose stories, whose wisdom will bless men, young boys, older men into greater heights of upward mobility. One of my guests, I call him a man of very many fasts. Fast to do this, fast to do that. Well, we'll get to learn more about him. The other guest, I call him the man who says dare to dream from the pit to the palace. A man whose journey I know personally, it will bless you, it will convict you, it will inspire you. Well, today I have these two great men, Taiwo and Ted. Oh this man. is the old man show. <laughs> oh man. Let me start with Taiwo. Tell me, just who are you? Who am I? Um, I'm a British, Kenyan, um, former professional footballer, now working in um, private equity. Um, but yeah. There's more to my story than just what I do. You know, I'm like everyone else, I'm a son, mm -hmm. my brother, um, and like everyone else, I'm working hard to, you know, make my parents proud, make my family proud. Absolutely. Um, and you wanna, you know, you wanna leave a lasting legacy that can help other people come the same path or inspire people to do, you know, what Fant they're good at doing. Fantastic, and we'll get to know more about you. Mr. Thomas, many call you Big Ted. I know yeah. you as Thomas Quaker or Molo. Yeah. By the way, did you uh, hear what he said? Oh, I do, do need subtitles. So we, we'll, we'll, we'll talk after that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're the only guy in the studio who's bleached themselves. So okay. Yeah. Bleached to black. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Purple. Tell us. Uh, yeah. So um, I'm just a beggar telling another beggar uh, where I found bread. Okay. Yes. Wow. Uh, it, does, it doesn't change who I am. It doesn't change what I do. I just try and make sure that uh, when I get enlightenment, I share it with other people to help their lives and to help their journeys uh, become better. You see, I think all of us um, are in the same storm. We just have different vessels. Mm -hmm. Some have boats, some have yachts. Some are just swimming, trying to get through. Some are clutching on straws. But I think all of us are in the same, same storm. Absolutely. Just different vessels. All right. And this show, as you know, is to encourage many people through your stories and through your wisdom, of course. Uh, the fact that you're sitting there, you've been through it all. And many people see the two of you, you know, doing great things. But many want to get to your place, but they don't understand the process, or maybe they don't really appreciate the process. But Taiwo, tell me something. I know you lost your dad through cancer, mm. but what is the one lesson your father taught you? The one thing that you say you will even teach your own son or your daughter that you picked from your own father? Um, I think. Um Perseverance, um, hard work, and um, integrity. My father was a very, very intelligent man. I never went to <laughs> university, but he, you know, went to the highest level of academia. He was a professor in journalism, um, and unlike me, um, you know, he studied and studied very hard to get out of. At the time, he was living in Siaya, when back in the probably 60s and 70s, it wasn't, you know as connected to the rest of Kenya as it is now. But I think, yeah, he taught me that um, it doesn't matter what challenges face you, it doesn't matter how difficult something is, you, you just continue working hard and, you know, you will eventually prevail. Absolutely. Well, fantastic. Mr. Kwaka. Yeah. Uh, Although I think, Taiwo, you've been to university. You. You went to visit uh, a friend of yours. I visited <laughs> Oh, that's the only way you went to university. <laughs> Tell you. Too yeah. Smart. Ted, you are a son of a bishop. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Businessman, but yes. he is more of a bishop. Yes, yes. Um, of course, the pressure of growing up as a bishop's son yeah. is, is quite immense. But what are some of, tell me one thing you have learned from your dad. Mm. So one of the things that I learned is, uh, just like T, I think is integrity. 
um, a very, very high level of integrity. And I think sometimes it's very frustrating uh, measuring yourself up against somebody whose uh, life and purpose is around that. And sometimes you feel like you have not reached where they are, yes. you know, for you to define yourself. Because every man looks to another man to define um, the, the mold that they want to, uh, to press themselves. Absolutely. In. Yeah. Talked about purpose. Do you think you're living your purpose? Well, I think I am. Um, in my next phase of life, in my new phase of life, I think the idea here is to, number one, empower people in whatever way, either by how I speak, how I live, um, and looking at small things that I'm doing that can inspire somebody else to make their life much better. Absolutely. And for me, that's purpose. Purpose is not necessarily um, a very deep spiritual or religious or philosophical space. Purpose is doing what you can do to make sure that the next person uh, has a better life. Right. And you don't have to have any benefit on it from mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Tao, you played professional football in the UK. You have been coached by Paul Masson, former Arsenal great. You have been coached by Ian Rush, uh, former Liverpool great. And, and first Kenyan to play in the English League, first Kenyan dual, Kenyan-British, to sign a professional contract in, in the UK. Uh, so you did quite a bit in the professional circles. Mm -hmm. You played even Puerto Rico or something, yeah. or all those things. But now you're doing something different. Would you call that your purpose? Uh, well, a lot of people are surprised about what I do now because it's completely um, it's different. on the other end of a um, spectrum. But I, I just like learning. I, you know, I've always had a passion for football when I was young. I used to love playing football. It's what gave me, I guess, um, an escape from where I was growing up or whatever situations I was going through. That's how I express myself. In terms of what I'm doing now, it's, it's similar. I, I enjoy challenges i enjoy um learning things that other people expect me not to know too much about but i i enjoy it for the i guess for the purposes of sometimes just making a difference and helping other people possibly learn something that they didn't know either um yeah so you know most footballers when we come out of football we we get put into coaching or management or tv punditry um, and I've just never really wanted to be just boxed into something that is, you know, category to, you know, my profession. I want to challenge myself and grow. So I think, yeah, you know, all men, all, all people must, you know, keep pushing and challenging yourself to exceed expectations and just not fit other people's idea or, you know, expectation of what you should be. Was it difficult to do the transition? And uh, yeah, I'm asking difficult. that because there's a young boy, there's a young man watching who has been doing this, but life is taking them to another realm. Yeah. And many people get stuck at the place of transition. Very difficult. You know, like I said, I, I finished school at 15, went straight into professional football. Um, so when I, fit, when I was obviously transitioning into um, business, um, it took a long time for me to get my head around things in law, things in companies. You know, these are things that we as footballers were never exposed to. So. Um, yeah, it was very difficult because I'd never had that foundational level of um, education. But I think at the end of the day, uh, one thing I've always had is um, discipline and hard work. Right. And my mother was, you know, um, really my, um, I guess, and my father were, were my um, standards, you know, because of where they came from and all the things they went through. You just, I think you grow up thinking, well, I can't give up on myself because they never gave up on me. Allow me to throw this in. Uh, mm -hmm your dad and your mom, especially your mom, because your mom raised you, mm. had a very big impression on your life. Mm. But they were not alive to see you sign your mm. first professional contract. When that happened, did you feel like giving up? Like, you know, you wanted so bad for them to see mm. you get into these heights of success. Did that maybe kill your spirit or did you now decide this is now what will push me or drive me to do something big and better? Yeah, I mean, at 15, I was an orphan, so, you know, it wasn't, I guess it wasn't my dream, it wasn't my plan for my mum not to be there for the, for the moment that I'd actually achieved something that everybody said I wouldn't. Um, it, I'd, I'd compare it to having the wind punched out of you right. for a long time, even at 35, I'm still, you know, you still don't get to grips with losing your mum. I think even people who are 50, 60, who have lost their parents um, and at a later age still struggle with... Um, not having them around. So 
yeah, it was it was difficult because for the first 15 years of my life, me and my mom and my twin, we struggled. You know, we we didn't have a lot of money, so to get to that milestone and then for her to not be there was was very difficult. But I think, you know, I always tell people, my mom gave me a lot of love as a kid. So I think when she left, I was almost of a view that if she's not here, I can't give up. I have to continue uh, the fight. I have to continue, right. um, you know, doing what she basically worked hard for. Um, you know, put sacrificed herself to give me that opportunity. So I never, never once did I feel like giving up, even when you know, it was it was very difficult. But yeah, I just kept working hard and mm. doing everything I did before. Well, just to encourage somebody, you know, you may be going through hell and high water and, and life just throws you bumps and uh, potholes and this. But just as Tai was saying, don't give up. Just keep on keeping on. Ted, many people, when they look at you, you are the epitome of success. Mm. Alpha male. You walk into a room and people are like, that's big Ted. But you on record to say, to say that you don't feel you are there yet. Mm. What do you mean? All right, so first of all, let me just speak about Taiwo. Taiwo is my very good friend. And Taiwo, I think, is a social investor. Maybe that's what he's what saying. Because right. everything which he does, he's always thinking about um, how can the community benefit. You know, he goes out of his way to do some crazy right. projects, which doesn't make sense to any normal businessman. And maybe that's something maybe which we can speak about him because I see from, from the outside. You know, um, he has this grand plan of setting up, setting up a stadium in the middle of nowhere, a football team that um, uh, everybody would ask him, you know, why would you go to Migori of all places and set up a, a football team? Why would you, you know, actually? Why would you do that, you know? So, but he, it's in his heart, you know? So he says that whatever business that uh, we're doing, that, you know, the business should be able to support the community. Absolutely. You know, so that's, that's a giving back. And, and for me, maybe from where I'm seated, I think it's a motherly instinct that maybe he picked up and he feels like all these kids, all these guys who don't have an opportunity to actually be able to go there, I can reach in for them. Absolutely. And be able to, um, to give it, to give it wow. out to them, you know. Mm. We so hope we'll have many like him yeah. giving back to society, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, so for me, I think... Um, my, my thought has always been this, is that always been, I had a dream. I have the dream that I want to achieve, what I want to do with my life. And um, until the other day, I was not necessarily living in the moment. So uh, I've been in this industry for 20 plus years. And it's only now that in the moment of my realization, I actually look back and think, okay, yes, I've actually made a very big impact on, on people's lives, on the industry. I've done my part uh, happily. Um, uh, looking back, and uh, today I was looking at some old pictures, and I could see myself starting, and I will vividly remember the things and the hopes and dreams that I had then. Now, 80%, 70% of them have come to pass, even without me knowing. So I think the most important thing about life is for you to be aware of the moment that you're standing in. Many people are standing in um, history-changing, uh, life-changing moments, but they'll never, ever know it. Yeah. Many people will stand with greatness. They'll never know it. So I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm grateful that God has given me an opportunity to be able to be in the moment of making change and touching people's lives in whatever small way that I can. Yeah. Tell me something, because I know you, and you have this thing of building up this young man in the creative industry and all that. Is that what you'd call success? What is success to you? Many people think success is driving a big car, living in a good address, having a big bank account. But a big Ted's definition of success, what gives you that fulfillment? What success is, success? is uh, 20 years later, I'm still here and I'm still relevant. For me, that's amazing success. Absolutely. Before, I would look at it as uh, money, making a lot of cash. But I've had money and I've lost money, big time. You know, I've had great amazing things in life i've lost all of them so right now my definition of success is 20 plus years later i'm still here i'm still relevant god has still given me the energy to make a difference and a change in people's lives i'm happy i'm doing what i need to do and to a young man who thinks success is money success is women success is yeah. uh, living in a big address please speak to them actually i want to change the definition and maybe change it to currency you see currency is whatever you use or you can use to trade, all right? So what is currency to you? What is valuable to you? Anybody, in, in the olden times in Africa, we had cowrie shells, we had gold, we had salt, 
we had silver, we had bronze, which was currency at that time. Yeah. And whoever had, Mansa Musa had all this and many, many more. He loves Mansa Musa. Well, he does. You know, <laughs> and he had many, many more. Okay, so we said he was rich. Okay, but um, in the olden times, in the Bible, we had people who lived to be 800 years. I don't know how old that is. You know, that, that's success. All right. You know, right now in my life, success for me is to be able to be alive in this time and for God to give an opportunity for you to be able to live uh, to be much, much more older. Wow. All right. I'm going to ask the two of you something. Um, in this season, especially Ted, for you, mm. uh, losing a loved one. Mm. I remember you gave me a call and said, well, let's meet at the hospital. Mm. And we got there while your brother was just ebbing away. Mm. He was still warm. Yeah. And I remember you playing music in his ears. Mm. Men are not allowed to mourn publicly. Mm. Uh, your mom mourned freely. Mm. Your sister Lily, I saw her mourning freely. Mm. But you and your dad, mm. I realized you didn't, you are the strong ones there. Mm. Is that a good thing? And how did you handle that? Because your dad at some point mm. walked away. Mm. Maybe he was going to mourn. Yeah. You stayed through. Mm. How do you handle that as a man? Do you feel that men need to show more emotions, especially for losing a loved one? Yeah. So, so I, I have come, I've lost quite a bit of, uh, of people. I mean, um, in, in the last few years, uh, three years, my friends, my brother, and then my, my, one of my best friends, Be Careful, passed away a couple of years ago, Bruce Odiambo, my mentor, about three, two, three years ago. And one of the things that I've come to realize is that everybody mourns differently. Right. Everybody has their own way of letting go. And one of the things I'm actually thinking about is during this corona season, there's been a lot of grief. And I'm wondering, when will people actually let go? Because people are holding it in. Every, every two minutes we're in a group. Everybody has lost somebody. Everybody has been affected by this particular thing. One of the things I'm coming to try to terms with is my style of mourning might not necessarily be yours. You know, grief is, is something very, very different. Personal. And people, people take it differently. Other guys would go jump into drink. Other guys would go jump into different things. How do you do it? Now, for me, I found out that when I lost my brother, that particular time, um, it was not necessarily an outpouring. I won't, I won't, uh, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a physical outpouring, but I had a breakdown, you know. I mean, when I lost Big Kev, I remember one, one day waking up in the middle of the night and just weeping and weeping uncontrollably, you know. But that was the time when I was able to let go. Would you have done the same in front of people? Well, um, uh, yes and no. Yes and no. One is there's the typical expectation of mourning and uh, when we're coming I was we're talk talking with Ty and we're saying one of the things about life is that many of the things that we are doing is actually a predetermined thing for example this is a very eloquent show so I'm expected to cross my legs but if this was another show I would have just, just been everywhere <laughs> I'm telling you so everything hold on thought. first yes. of all I want to thank you for respecting the Omen show yeah but I'll come to you after the break ladies and gentlemen <laughs> just hold on there because uh, this eloquent show is coming back just in a minute and Ty will also want you to tell us how you have managed to mourn and release your parents mm -hmm. thank you very much and see you after the break Well, it's good to have you back. Every man, I'm sure you're watching. Every son is watching. If you're a lady, bring your sons, your nephews, and let them watch, even your daughters, so that we know how we're trying to grow our young men into great men. As I said, we are not a show of perfect men, but a show of men who want to be better tomorrow than they are today. And just before we turn the break, Ted, you're talking, uh, before I get to Taiwo, uh, let me call him Tai. All right, Tai is better. <laughs> he wants some oatmeal. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about the morning and how different it is for a man and I asked you yeah you said you suffered a breakdown at night yeah did you is it because as men we are supposed to be strong in front of everybody that's why even your system programmed you to mourn at night when you're alone I think I think I think it wasn't necessarily um, programmed I think it's the realization that oh my this has actually happened I remember um, I used to work on at a, at a, at a radio station a couple of years ago and right. I got fired and uh, the way this guy fired me he fired me so well because um, uh, I'd worked there for five years and uh, one of the premier um, presenters on that particular station and this guy had a nice talk and he told me he believes in me and he thinks I can be the biggest thing uh, Kenya has ever seen and I was so excited 
And then he told me, you know, I have to let you go. I, I can't wait for your potential to come. And I was like, yeah, thank you very much. And I was so psyched up, I left. As I was walking down past the parking lot, it hit me. I've just been fired. Wait a minute. I have just been fired. I'll never go back there as the person I used to be. So I think many times and from very many men, we usually have a delayed reaction to very many things. Some of it is predispositioned uh, by society. Mm -hmm. Some of it is just the manly nature that you have, that you, you're meant to be a strong guy. You can carry this thing on your back. I mean, for my brother, I didn't cry. All right. So I'd had more, I'd, I'd have very sad moments. But I remember when we had put him into the grave and everybody was walking to go back to the house for prayers, I got into my car and drove off. So uh, where we come from is on, uh, on, a, on a hill. And I parked the car on a cliff and I just sat there and cried. I cried my heart out, you know, until some neighbor spoiled the party. He actually came there to find out whose car that was. And I had to clean up my tears and in I had, to, words, en I had words, to engage him in talk. In other words, it was a big car. That's why, yeah? It was actually a Prado. But we are sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Well, hold on a bit. I'll, yeah. I'll come back to you. Ty, you've grown up. You grew up in Brixton. Brixton mm. is not the easiest place to grow up, mm. right? Signed your professional papers at a very, very young age. Mm. I mean, at the age in which you signed your professional papers, some kids are still watching Cartoon Network. Mm. You know, what are some of the mistakes you think you made? Because now you, you are young and you're getting into a level of success at a very young age. You've lost your parents. You're a hero who is your mother. What are some of the mistakes you think you made during that season and even as a business person? Yeah, uh, uh, just uh, obviously talking about the, the very things that you're going through. I never, like Ted saying, when I was young, um, like most young boys or men, you just bottle it all in. Um, I, I would cry every night for probably two years after my mum passed away, but no one would have known it and no one would have thought, you've just lost your mum because I never wanted anyone to uh, I think I never wanted anyone to feel sorry for me and I never wanted to have like this perception that I was like a, an orphan I, I only until probably about two years ago did I accept that I was an orphan <laughs> so you know I just I think my mum kind of instilled that in me it wasn't necessarily a masculine thing it was like my mum always used to say you know P, PMA positive mental attitude always focus on the positives um, but yeah, grief is an important, I think it's, a, it's an important cycle to go through anyway, because if you don't release that, that sorrow, that, that disappointment, whatever it is you're feeling, it can obviously, you know, sometimes it can be turned into something else. Right. I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I was able to turn my grief into um, a positive energy. You know, I expressed it in my football. I had a lot of energy in football. So people used to be like... What tight. position did you play by? I was a striker. Okay. Um, but I was a striker that would, you know, chase down loose ends. I was putting defenders on the back foot. I'd be running them into the corners. So I had a lot of energy. I still have a lot, of, a lot of energy. Um, Being beat down. And yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it all comes from it all comes from the drive of you know losing something you love so much. And I, I, you don't really lose people. You, they're just not here physically. You know, you still I still love my mom now. Um, and I've been alive on this earth longer now than I had been with her um, as a child. So you, you never lose the love you have for people, but they're not there and sometimes that can be disappointing. But you just have to keep looking forwards and channel that, that energy towards positivity. All right. Yeah. I like yeah. that. Yeah. But looking back, tell me one mistake. All of us, I'm sure, if I, a anybody, if you ask them, what is the one mistake you did? All of us have that mistake that we, th we hope or wish we never did. What is that one mistake you did? I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, no one's perfect, you know. Of mis course. Mistakes can be subtle. They can be, you know, making the wrong decision. I've made a lot of bad decisions. Um, You're still and had my mum, <laughs> <laughs> had my mum been alive, I may have not made those decisions. But right. you know, like Ted's saying, you know, in life, um, making mistakes is is part of learning. And you know, I always tell people, don't be so adverse to trying something because by trying. You may, you, I mean, we wouldn't have aer aeroplanes if someone didn't try jumping off a cliff with wings, did, would we? Absolutely. So for me, you must try, and if you feel like something is achievable, just try it. If you fail, try again. 
and that's success. You know, trying again and again and again until you get it right. Um, that's so what I, I, I define as success. I want to ask the million dollar question. Mm. Does society really care about men? And men in a crisis, when you look at our age, grown men, older than us, and the younger boys coming up, is there a crisis for the men? Ted. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd say I think we are actually walking into it. it we, think, we thought it was there before, but we're actually walking into it. You can't emancipate one particular sex by dis-emancipating the other one. Right. You can't franchise one by disfranchising the other guy. Mm -hmm. I think we, our attention is rightfully with the woman. We're trying to level them up. But also I think that we are losing it a bit. And of course, many of the reactions that we have are not politically correct, especially at this season right now. And everybody will come and plunge on you and everything. And um, uh, men would not necessarily support even the thought that I'll bring forth that the man is being disfranchised because already by admitting, he's already admitting that they're at a, at a, at a lesser, lesser, lesser space. Yes. And I think it's actually true. We're actually um, heading into a crisis. Um, two, it's basically because there are more, and I've seen lots of people who come to a place whereby the, the ladies have more, um, the more open doors for them right now as we speak than the man. Now, the man is not aware about what's going on, about that particular thing. But also, the man is also dropping the ball. Because the man, God gave the man some instructions. He gave the man, not the woman or both of them. There are some instructions which were given to the man. It's the same, same way if the director came here and said, okay, I'm giving these instructions to you as the host. He gave you the instructions. If this show goes haywire, it's your problem. It's not everybody else's problem. We might try to rescue it. The ladies in the room might try to support it and everything. Right. But the instructions, the manual was given to the man. So immediately the man drops the ball, then everything starts going haywire. And we cannot continue complaining that somebody else has taken up a responsibility or a position or anything, and it's us who dropped the ball. How do you... Uh, there are men watching, and they're screaming, asking, how have we dropped the ball? What do you mean we have dropped the ball? Number one. One of the things that uh, we were given is dominion, is leadership. We are meant to lead. Immediately, we are not able to lead in whatever situation it is. Then that's where the problem comes in. Now, there's a very, very big difference between leadership and pain. All right. So, for example, we assume that leaders, and it's been shown worldwide, that leaders do not show any pain. So you'll never ever see a head of state sick. You'll never ever see a leader who's having a problem and can come and say, guys, you know what, man, I'm so heartbroken, you know. We just, these things just happen. It's almost like pregnancy in some cultures. You never see the girls pregnant, but you just see kids popping up everywhere and you wonder, okay, where are these guys right. coming from? Okay. I think the most important thing is this, is that men need to understand what have we been told to do? What instructions did God give us? Because that's where I want to start from. It's the God angle and then everything else Absolutely. plays in. Wow. Tao, you've grown up in, Lon you're born in London, mm. you've played in Charlton, is it? Uh, yeah, I was also a young boy, yeah. Yeah, so you have seen men here and in London. Mm. Do you think we have a crisis? Because we, we just don't say it's a Kenyan issue, it's a man issue. Mm. Are you seeing some of the problems we have here? and mirror the same to the ones in the UK. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's a human crisis because, you know, like Ted's saying, you know, people um, have cultural um, expectations of a man and a woman. Even, you know, my mum grew up in England. It was legal up until um, 1992 for a husband to rape his wife, meaning a husband could rape his wife and not be prosecuted. So. These kind of cultural um, expectations and norms, I think, have been affecting humanity for possibly thousands of years. But looking at everybody now, we're more conscious of these things and we are trying to make sure that women have equality and equity. And, and me, I'm a big equity kind of person. Mm -hmm. I believe that women should be given the things they need to, to be the best that they want to be. Um, and I think, you know, we as men should be able to recognize, okay, in whatever working environment, how can we give someone 
who isn't being given the very tools they need to do the, the labour or the service that they, they're good at giving. Um, and I think we as men should be the ones giving women that platform and also the business models and the various different trade secrets that I guess some of the, the bigger companies have always kind of enjoyed. So I think, yeah, power is about giving. It's not about taking. Um, and so in some instances, yes, you know, Ted's right. We as men have always been given that instruction to be the leader, to be the, the provider, yeah. to, you know, to protect. Um, and, and that power comes with responsibility. And when we realize that we can give some of that power, um, I think that's more powerful. All right. Yeah. Oh. But, 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 but Robert, I think, let me, let me just, uh, I think one of the biggest problems I think we're facing is the issue of we are growing in a generation, we're in between two generations. We are one in a generation which believes in equity or is trying to provide an equal space. And then we are in another generation which is coming from a very chauvinistic place. So the older people expect us in our generation to be this way. Mm. And then the people we are living with expect us to be this way. There's a very, very big clash. Mm. Many of the kids who are growing up, their parents maybe came from a very totally different place. They would never Absolutely. cook, never step into the mm. kitchen, never do anything. But here you're marrying or you're involved with a girl who expects you to step up to the plate, mm. you know, cook. Do the other things that you're meant to do. So there's a clash. But the guys of old, they don't, don't believe in Actually, that. they actually think when if you ever come up, they'll tell you you've been sat on. You know, like yeah. you're being controlled by the woman. Mm. So it's a clash um, of, of of ideologies. Now, this is what I have decided to live my life. I've decided that anything you see on this world was started by someone. Fashion, anything, any way anybody is dressing was started by someone. There's no school, university, board which sits and says, okay, this is the standard way of dressing or right. anything. Mm. You can even decide to wear two different pairs of shoes. It's your style. There's no one to tell you what to do. Style though, yes. it's fine. So if you decide, <laughs> <laughs> if you decide that you want um, uh, equity in your house, I mean, I would cook in my house. I can wash dishes in my house. I can do anything else that needs to be done. Yeah. There's, there's nobody I'm reporting to. You know? All right. And you brought the God factor. Ty, how important is spirituality in your life? Massive. My mum was, yeah, my mum was a spiritual Christian. I, I am a spiritual Christian by, yeah, I believe in, you know, the fundamentals of Christianity in a spiritual manner. Um, yeah, look, I think faith, love, these principles um, are based on the spirit of um, people Absolutely. Um, treating each other with respect, integrity dignity um, and sometimes I think you know we may be just given um, the scriptures and the religious what I call the kind of like um, kind of doing things that we think are right Absolutely. instead of kind of feeling the things and then connecting with people in that in that way um, I've always yeah I've always approached people with the idea that I shouldn't underestimate you I shouldn't think less of you, I should get to know you, I should give you time, um, I shouldn't judge, right. prejudge, I shouldn't have a preemptive idea of who and what you may be. Okay. So yeah, I think in life people um, maybe lose out on opportunities because they always think they know what someone is or what someone can do and unless you're driving a Range Rover or a Prado. Um, buying bottles in a club or whatever it is, then you're no good to me. Okay. And, and unfortunately, that's, that's wrong. I've met the best people with little or nothing Absolutely. in terms of materials. And they, through their, um, you know, with their substance, have taught me more about myself than anyone else. Don't look down upon anybody. Don't look down and, and don't, um, yeah, don't underestimate people. Ted. Pastor Ted, how important is spirituality in your life? Well, it's important because it gives you a uh, great balance mm -hmm. and it's able f uh, to help you know who your source is. And regardless of whatever it is, we're also living in a time when people are very aware spiritually and you have guys drifting away from it, guys, other people who've been hurt by religion or by their faith yeah. are drifting everywhere. So everybody's drifting, everybody's searching, everybody's seeking. But the most important thing is a connection to the source. Even your phone, regardless of whatever it can do, what, if it drains out its source, then it's not able to power up. Absolutely. So yeah. everybody needs to punch up to a source and be able to, to do it. Um, um, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a phase in my life where I'm 
I'm taking the things that I believe in literally. So I'm a I'm a, I'm a seeking Christian, you Thank know. You. I'm 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 I'm, a, I'm a, I call myself a reasoning Christian because that's what the, that's what God tells. God God says, "Come, reason let us together. reason together." So it means that if I have a question about a story in the Bible, I go back to Him to reason. You know, I won't just think and decide. Okay, it was written, so I will not. I'm a reasoning guy. I'm going to ask hard questions. I'm going to ask anything. I'm not going to, if I'm in your church or in your fellowship, I'm not just going to believe in stuff because you've said it. No, I'm going to reason with God. I'm going to back, go, go. I'm Absolutely. going back to God, reason okay. with him. Let him enlighten me in his way and tell me, tell you, you know what? This is what I meant by this particular thing. One, number two is the idea of faith and hope because above everything, hope is the most important thing. And hold on to that hope. We will be back. And I hope that you will still hold on to us. We'll be back after this break. Well, thank you very much for holding on to us. I'm sure you're all enjoying. Thank you. And Ted, you're talking about hope just before we went on the break. Yeah. Yes. Hope is important because hope gives you um, a purpose to be able to do stuff. You know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that after this corona thing, that we shall be able to go back to some, some sort of normalcy and be able to achieve and chase and build on the dreams that all of us had. Absolutely. You know, I, I'm hoping that things, things turn out well. I'm hoping stuff. So hope is very, very important for me. And uh, that's what my plug into spirituality is. All right. It's Thank about you. hope. Thank you. Ty, are you in a relationship? I'm just going direct on this. I'm so yes sorry. or no? Are you in a relationship? No, I'm single. Okay. <laughs> what, Ty, what, why are you uh, single? Ted, uh, I mean, you're, you're a handsome young man, successful. Why are you single, Ty? Ted is actually avoiding this question. So Ted, <laughs> Ted are you? No, let Ty, let no, Ty no, no, tell no, us no. why. Ty, hold on. You know? Ted, are you in a relationship? <laughs> yes, I am. You are in a relationship? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm in a marriage ship. You're in a marriage ship. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Ted, yeah. a few years ago, you are vocal about um, how you lost your weight. Yes. I mean, Big Ted came because you did big things, but yeah. also physically, you're big. Yeah. But it's evident for anybody who knew you then and now that there's a massive transformation, all right? How do you then maintain your commitment to this health? Because when, I mean, how did you lose your weight first? All right, so I need to be honest and say that I did not drink Morubaini and stuff or strong tea or anything. I did, I did an operation, just called, uh, it's a mini gastric bypass. Mini and gastric bypass. Yes, okay. I was 168 kgs. I'm now 100. I lost 68 k kilograms. And the way it's done, you're not able to add any more weight past the the past the set um, your BMI. Okay. Yes. So you can't go past that. But also, uh, you're still able to continue. Your body can force itself to get bigger if you don't take care of yourself. So I try my best. I exercise. I Work out. I play basketball for five hours every Saturday morning with a team of men called Wagyuzi. I'm tr I'm very active. I walk around a lot, and uh, also my work dictates that I'm always on my feet. So I'm doing my best in that particular area. Okay. And then also food. I can't be able to eat much because I have a reduced uh, stomach. It's very very uh, shrunk. All right. Yes. Ty, professional footballer. You said you're the kind of striker who would go back and Run help defend walls. and uh, you know put defenders on their f on their back and all that so fitness is something that you're used to how do you maintain that now that you're not playing professional football yeah it's difficult doing many things traveling to Bigori, doing yeah. all these things it's difficult um obviously when you're playing professionally you're uh, you're basically an elite athlete you're eating sleeping drinking thinking football and and yeah your your schedule is is pretty much that um now that i'm doing um more, I guess, project building, investment structuring, and, and, and corporate governance. Um, most of my time is spent reading, um, drafting contracts, um, sending emails. Um, yeah, not much physicality. So I, I, I do maintain um, um, a schedule of some exercise in the week. I'll, I'll still go and do some cardio three times a week. I'll do um, my weights and my sit-ups and push-ups. But I still eat very um, conservatively, so yeah. I think my eating habits have always remained the same. Mm -hmm. um, also, you you run, you're running. 
yes. away from relationships. I'm running away from relationships. <laughs> no, do you do you, I'm just tripping with it. Do you desire to be in a relationship? Uh, okay, let me, uh, let me, my, let me. My, my biggest desire is to, I guess, do what makes me feel fulfilled in life. I'm, I'm, I'm always of the view that if you're going to be in a relationship with someone, it will be because you meet them along the path in which you're supposed to, I guess, meet. Right. I don't go looking for relationships. I don't think, yeah, I don't sit there praying to my Lord for a woman. I think y you, you meet the people you love um, by doing what you love. Right. Um, and that's, yeah, that's kind Along of Along the path always, of yeah, purpose. That's but let's be honest, we are all men here. Are you in a relationship? Okay. Good As good. I was saying. We are <laughs> 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 As I was saying, we are all men here. Ted is in a relationship. And before he went into that relationship, he had his idea of a woman. You understand? Uh, even if it's in the path of purpose, what is your ideal kind of woman? Someone who's, I guess, happy and content with themselves. Um, you know, happiness, I've always, I've always been of the view, happiness is an inward thing. You can't seek happiness from others. You must be happy first within yourself and then right. you share it with others. Um, so I think, yeah, anyone who's happy, content, um, spiritually, emotionally with themselves, doesn't need to borrow, doesn't need to take, doesn't need to depend on, is, is someone that, even if it's your friend or your family member, um, is a good relationship. Absolutely. Um, in terms of, you know, meeting someone you, you eventually want to marry and have a family with. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to meet someone who shares the same values and the same principles, which is more so open-minded to the, you know, um, to the aspect of, um, in life, not just following the, I guess, the, the conveyor belt, um, kind of, yeah. So, okay. someone who's interested in doing things that are not everyday things. Okay. Ted, you're in a relationship, you said. How have your past relationship helped you in dealing with your present relationship? Lesson learned. Mm. One of the things that um, I'm learning is to fight. Fight? Yes. Please clarify that statement. So, you know, it's very easy for, for you to be in a situation, um, in an ugly situation and not fight for it. And I know that in my past, if I had fought for my relationships or for things that mattered to me, then the story would have been very, very different right now. Okay. You know, you can be in a relationship and uh, you don't see eye to eye, but you fight for it. You know, you stay there and fight uh, instead of walking away. Because trust me, there'll always be distractions out there and comforts every time you have a fight. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things, and uh, that's basically accommodating um, each other. Number two is the aspect that the other person also, like just what Ty said, the other person needs to find themselves and to find their own happiness before they come and find you. It's not your responsibility to give them their happiness or to try and make them happy. You I Immediately you find somebody who's already happy, and you're happy, or you're complete, you're able to be much, much better than two people who are trying to find their happiness, I'm trying to find mine, you're trying to find yours, and we're just in a merry-go-round, uh, running around each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Ty, relationships are so important, and I want to delve into the family relationships. Mm. Um, they put you in balance. As a professional footballer, when you signed papers at a very young age, how important, and by the way, you're a twin, mm. how important was family to you? then and now yeah everything um i was yeah my mom was like my connection to society so when i was playing football as a young boy i'd get yeah sometimes i'd get in trouble we play on the streets even at school i got stopped from playing football so my mom would always be the one who would come and kind of explain to people oh no nah, you know he's just you know expressing himself he didn't mean this or so yeah family is everything because they 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 keep you grounded they also they give you the, the time and the emotion and attention that you wouldn't otherwise get from anyone else. Your, like your mum and dad are the two people on this planet who will call you, answer your calls at any time, any place. And I guess that was the first thing I recognised when my mum passed away was that she wasn't calling me at um, 12 at night on a Friday night. Um, <laughs> and previously I was always embarrassed by that. But then when she, when she left, it was like the first thing I, I missed. Um, so family is everything, um, and also you know when you're going through your hard times, they are the they are the like the trampoline for you to bounce back off. 
because sometimes you can hit the bottom and then no one's there to pick you up and I think the difficulty I found obviously when my mum passed was that when I had an injury when I had something I didn't really understand as a young as a young ad, as a young teenager I didn't really understand I never really had the confidence to go to let's say my aunt or my sister or my brother um, and therefore I would just take it on myself um, and so yeah I think having parents to, to, to bounce problems off and to bounce you up when you hit the bottom is, 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 is everything so All right. yeah it's the difference oh thank you Mr. Quaker mm. we've seen men and kisses of because it's a men's show and I want us just to throw this we've had cases of men doing not very good things to women uh, rape cases, uh, violence, objectifying a woman, where you hear women say, I was passing and they were whistling or somebody tapped me. What can we do as men, and especially our age? What do you want to tell the younger men who are looking up to us on how to treat women and honor women? Hmm. Maybe the idea here would be... Um Everybody who has a sister, cousin, relative, auntie, mom, is that just imagine what you're doing being done to your person. You know, um, everything within the bounds of uh, acceptance. Young men need to know how to take care of this woman. In fact, I would want to have a campaign, two campaigns. One campaign would be for the men and boys and everything to take care of the women. So it's called take care of the girl, whether it's your mom, whether it's your auntie and everything. But also on the flip side, I would also want to have another campaign, stop killing our men. Because we're also having a counter right now with a lot of violence towards the man, and the man is not able to tell. So very, many, very few men would actually come out and say in a show like this, hey, I was beaten yesterday properly, you know, um, we had a case there that some time back with great prominent people having all their drama up, up on TV and everything. Right. So it's something. Men are also facing the same, same abuse uh, in very different formats. And um, I think we just need to take care of each other. Understanding, respecting. So, so women should respect the men as 100%. well. hundred percent. Okay. Yes. Why don't men talk? Well, I think it's... By the time you're hearing a story of a man... Yes, it's actually... It's in a bad place already. I, th I, th I think it's, it's society. Society expects us to... Um, we, we, you see, when you raise the uh, Robert, you're told, uh, when is Simba? Simba Ili, you know? So you're taught and brought up to understand that you're a lion, and lions don't cry. Ty, so, were you told that in Brixton, Kevin, growing up as well? No, it's not, not... Yeah, it's the society that tells you this, isn't it? I guess... The perception is that you're 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 lion, you're you're strong, you're you're black boy. Um, you must be strong, um, and it's it's a cultural thing, and that's sometimes where you know I think, especially in England, the the fathers they neglected the young boys um, in that kind of context because they thought, okay, you know, I have to be strong myself. I can't be affectionate, I can't be too loving, I can't be too smothering because then he won't be strong enough to deal with all the things that society is going to throw at him. And I think, that's, I think that's the wrong way to think, you know. My grandfather was um, a former military doctor, served in the Second World War, and I got most of the love and affection from any man from him. And, you know, I still think of the days in which, you know, I had a hug or a kiss from him, and those give me a lot of comfort and a lot of uh, security and confidence so I think you know love love is the most important thing in any, any relationship how you love yourself is also very important because that's how you will also ultimately treat other people absolutely but, but let me just jump into something he just said you know uh, in our context that does strange stuff to hear you're being hugged by uh, your but dad let me, pic let me picture this with you yeah, ten, yeah? It's, uh, your father is tall you're if, tall if, if you dare <laughs> In the, in the African setup, if you dare tell your, your dad, you know, as a man, dad, I love you, very few men have actually told their, their dads they love them. You know, if you just dare bring up such stories, they'll be asked, uh, is there a problem? Are you okay? Like, what, what, what is the, really the situation? But do we need now to bring that culture? Because he says yes. he remembers 
what his grandfather did. Uh -huh. and, and it has held him in good stead now. And mm. I think you'll find that he's very strong on the area of affirmation. He doesn't need to be affirmed by anyone because he was already affirmed. Mm. One of the things, the problems we have and the problems many of us face is affirmation. We are not affirmed as young, as young people. So we're expected, you just go hunt, go bring whatever you'll bring, but make sure you bring the big one. So if you go out there and bring a small thing, uh, you don't find it. You don't feel like it's actually worth it, you know. And that's why people or men who find themselves in situations whereby sometimes where the women earns more than they bring to the table, they feel that they're bringing less mm. to the table because they feel that they were told you must bring the biggest and the, and the fattest piece of, 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 of meat to this, to this relationship. Right. Love should be unconditional. Love should be unconditional. It should not be based upon like what Ted's saying. It shouldn't be based upon what you're bringing in or what you've not brought in. Right. And sometimes I think there are um, generations in which love was given almost like a reward. So you did well. Okay, now I'll give you a hug. Yeah. Now I love you. You didn't do well. Oh, you're not. You're not. You're, yeah. you're disowned. And yeah. so, yeah, I, uh, from a young age, my grandfather, my mother, they just loved me, even when I was doing nonsense. <laughs> even when I kicked the ball into someone's window or broke someone's um, um, door, whatever it was, um, they just, you know, loved me. And that affirmation made me realize, you know what? I gotta make these people proud because right. if I continue doing this nonsense, you know, I'm letting them down. And why should I let them down when all they've done is love me? Love so I think, you know, love is an important thing and, and being affectionate to young boys, fathers, grandfathers, being affectionate to your, to your young boys is a good thing because it will make them feel later on that they must take more responsibility. Wow. Love is unconditional. Ted says at the top, and I, I take that home, and I, from you I take, let's go back to the source. Let's go back to the source as men. Well, thank you very much for watching, but before I, I go off, please vote for Switch TV as your favorite TV station. In fact, pick your phone right now. Ted, I hope you'll do that as well. Ty, uh, vote for Switch TV. Time. You don't have airtime. <laughs> I will get you airtime. <laughs> Vote for Switch TV as your favorite TV station. What you do, SMS the word KUZA for free to 15601. KUZA. SMS KUZA for free to 15601. What is the most interesting thing you have in your wallet? I don't carry a wallet. What is the one thing that annoys you most? I had juxtaposers and liars. What is your favorite car? Uh, Mercedes-Benz 126 300SL, which I have. The most used app on your phone? Uh, WhatsApp. What is your favorite song? Well, it depends, uh, but I love reggae. Scale of 1 to 10, how good are you at keeping secrets? Uh, 1.2, <laughs> 9.8. What is your guilty pleasure? Wow, I love sweet stuff. I have a sweet tooth. Who has it easier, men or women? Well, it depends, but I think women in most cases. What do you notice first about someone you meet? Shoes. If you could ask God one question, what would it be? Uh, when is this corona going to end? Ty, what is the most interesting thing you have in your wallet? Nothing. Okay, what is your favorite car? Uh, BMW X6. Messi or Ronaldo? Messi. If you could be a professional in one other sport, which one would it be? Basketball. The most used app in your phone? Uh, Adobe. What is your favorite song? Songs or song. Song. What is your favorite song? I don't have one. Okay. The most, the person who makes you laugh the most in the world? No one. No one. <laughs> Who has it easier, men or women? Men. Scale of 1 to 10, how good are you at keeping secrets? Uh, 10. Say a word in Luo. <laughs> uh, I can't say a word in Luo. Well, thank you, thank you very much for watching. This has been the best show in Eastern Central Africa, south of the Sahara. And this is the Old Man Show. Thank you very much and see you next week.